Hello, and a heartfelt welcome to the 2022 Zero Prostate Cancer Summit. I'm Zero CEO Jamie Burst coming to you from outside of Boston, Massachusetts. If you're new to the cause or to Zero, I want to give you a special welcome. And if you're an old friend, I can't find the words for how much I miss your smiling face and your beautiful families. Thank you all for joining us live right now and for being part of this special community of prostate cancer survivors, families, advocates, and cause heroes. We have a full slate of exciting topics and speakers today, and I'd like to take a moment to thank our premier sponsor for the 2022 Zero Prostate Cancer Summit, Pfizer Oncology. Pfizer Oncology, like Zero, is committed to improving the lives of men living with prostate cancer. We wouldn't be together today across the globe without your support. Here's what I'm excited for you to experience today. First off, the platform that we're on this year is absolutely fantastic. And I'm grateful for all of my colleagues at Zero for designing and building it, and everybody across the organization for putting together this great event. Um, there's a lot that goes into it. So thanks to the staff and all of our volunteers for helping out. Um, you can find previous sessions and chat with others all right here in the platform. Um, by the way, I wanna give a special thank you to all of our summit ambassadors who are helping others navigate the experience this weekend. If you're looking for something, it's all right here in the platform. Second, I'm excited about is um, being able to connect with one another through the chat. And third, um, how about the sessions we have coming up? Um, coming up today in just a little while, um, we have clinical trial enrollment and the importance of uh, the importance diversity plays in advancing prostate cancer screening. Um, so that's coming up in an overview of what's changing in the prostate cancer treatment space um, with leading national experts in zero board members, doctors Alicia Morgans and Kelvin Moses. Uh, but now I want to bring in my friend and colleague, Zero's Vice President of Patient Programs and Education, Shelby Muneer. Good morning, Shelby. How are you? Hey, Jamie. Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Good morning. I know it's early for some of you, especially uh, on the West Coast, but we're so thrilled to see all of you hopping into the Summit platform. I know, uh, Jamie, I can't agree more. It's such a fun, cool platform, so interactive. Um, the chat last night was uh, unbelievable, all of, the, all of the love coming through. Um, but just know, uh, you know, please drop us a note, say hello, tell us where you're uh, joining us from. We have a lot of Zero staff on hand as well. So if you have questions, please let us know. We'll get those answers uh, for you as soon as we can, point you in the right direction um, and, and get you going. Um, so uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're thrilled. We, we just are so excited. Hate to be virtual, but but thrilled to have you here. That's right. I, I, you were mentioning... Um at the Bowl for Blue Awards last night um, with everybody chatting with each other. It's so, so nice to connect with everybody and you know show the love to everybody. So it's great. And, and Shelby, this is our, our second uh, virtual summit. And as much as uh, you alluded to, we'd all love to be in, in one room and be in person together. And we will, we will do that, uh, just not soon enough. But there are some perks to being virtual, right? Yeah, definitely. And you know, what's amazing is we had more than 1,500 people register for the summit. So that really says something, especially with all of the Zoom fatigue that is very, very real. We're all experiencing it. We're uh, uh, virtual with our families, with our friends, with our colleagues. Um, you know, so to, to hit a record for zero in the number of people that we got registered for this event was a real milestone for the prostate cancer community. And it really is a silver lining. We, we certainly couldn't help uh, with this event, all of the people that were able to help um, in an in-person setting. So definitely a silver lining through the virtual. We just have to keep telling ourselves that and repeating that over and over as we get a little burnt out in the virtual setting. So, um, you know, I also think after last night, I can't imagine you won't agree. Um, I, I, there's no way I could meet all of the people virtually that, that I um, have. I, this is my second summit here with Zero and after last night's presentations, after last night's Bold for Blue Awards, I feel like I'm friends with these people that I've never even met. So uh, the community is certainly growing stronger and we're making the best of this virtual uh, space and virtual platform. Um, so to our attendees, I, I really hope that you do take the time to explore the Summit platform. It's amazing, it's user-friendly, it's intuitive. 
Um, and it's exclusive to you because you registered. So make sure you check out all of those tabs. They're on the left side of your screen. Um, we get to kind of skip our speaker bios. We love our speakers. We're so impressed with them, but you can read those on your own and we are able to get right to the presentations. We have chat, we have Q&A forums, a lot of patient resources, both from our sponsors and from Zero. Um, on Monday, we're gonna have some amazing support lounges. I think we, <clears throat> excuse me, I think we have 10 support lounges coming your way. Um, a lot of happy hours and, and, and times to interact with uh, Zero staff and chapter directors. So. I uh, just couldn't be more thrilled. And, and like we said, the chat feature was really fun and interactive last night. A lot of shout outs, a lot of showing the love. So it uh, really just makes this event so special. And, uh, you know, based on your feedback, we modified the summit a little bit this year. Um, and, and, and I won't say, I'm not, I'm not too proud to say that based on your feedback, I'm going to insert a little shameless plug for the uh, summit evaluation. Make sure that you fill that out for us. We do read that, um, we, we make changes, we make it uh, the best for you. Um, so when everything wraps up, actually technically on Tuesday after all of our amazing uh, advocates hit the hill, uh, virtually of course, um, be sure to fill that evaluation out. We read through them, we, we, we really do comb through them uh, diligently and, and make sure that we can make uh, the best of your feedback. Um, you'll also notice the on-demand session. So we have, I think 13, more than 10, uh, on-demand sessions, amazing array of uh, topics. They cover everything from treatment to diagnostics to how to get a second opinion to how to get the best um, information from your health insurance plan. Uh, really, really amazing um, session there. And those are made possible only because of our generous sponsor. So I want to give a quick shout out to Blue Earth Diagnostics, Boston Scientific, Foundation Medicine, and Lanthius Medical Imaging. Yeah, Shelby, I, I just can't uh, stop gushing about uh, last night. Everybody up on putting their pictures up on social media and uh, and sharing their experience uh, with their network and their family and friends too. And it was it was really um, really lovely to see that. And and um, I saw some questions coming in of, hey, I missed a few minutes of this part or I missed a few minutes of that part. You know, can I will I be able to watch that again? So all of the sessions that that Shelby just went went over um the the more than 10 sessions that we're going to have for you in, in these in these two days um you can you can watch them whenever you want after they 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 air and we have a break coming up in just a few hours so everyone can explore those topics then but right now uh i'm going to zip it and pass it over to shelby because i'm excited uh to kick off our first session of the day so i hand it off to you shelby have fun Great. thanks jamie we'll see you soon um, so thanks everyone, uh, thrilled about our first session, uh, really a great way to kick us off in the kind of the science space, the treatment space. So our first session is understanding the treatment continuum. Uh, we have Dr. D J. Javeri joining us. We're going to call him Dr. J because we are great friends. Uh, Dr. Javeri currently serves as the Director of Medical Affairs Oncology at Bayer Pharmaceuticals. Jay, thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Shelby. It gives me a tremendous pleasure and an honor to be here amongst a panel of fantastic experts to discuss a topic that's very well known to some of us and becoming better known to others, and that's prostate cancer and understanding the treatment continuum as well as the treatment landscape. So I'm honored to be here once again. My name is Jay Javeri. I'm the Director of Genital Urinary Medical Affairs at Bayer Pharmaceuticals in the Oncology Division. And once again, absolutely honored to be included with this host of fantastic experts and thank the Zero organization for putting so much time and effort into organizing this wonderful lecture and this ability to be here. So to get started, basically what I want to do is ensure that today's lecture covers almost a 30,000 foot view of how the patient interacts with the physician and essentially what the thought process is and the philosophy of each person is during the interactions. These interactions and communication points give us the ability to decide on how to treat the patient, change the paradigm, uh, select a different medication, do all kinds of things. So it's really about the communication between the physician and the patient. And that's why we find the zero advocacy group to be so critically important within that. So a couple of quick disclaimers and some housekeeping. These slides are the property of Bayer and uh, they are intended for scientific and educational purposes by Bayer personnel. 
and they're not intended for promotional use and may contain some type scientific information for compounds that have not yet received regulatory approvals. So with that, I can begin by explaining our table of contents. So today, I'll briefly walk through the epidemiology or how common prostate cancer is by incidence and prevalence, frequency numbers, some uh, interesting statistics relating to that. A description of key terms. So terminology is a big problem in prostate cancer and you'll re re hear it referred to as a heterogeneous disease, meaning that there are a lot of different substates and substages of prostate cancer, different buckets of prostate cancer we'll attempt to explain them in a very simple fashion so that patients can understand which thought process the physician is now undergoing. We'll also describe the prostate cancer paradigm, the treatment landscape, and as well as the critical physician patient discussion points that people will invariably uh, end up talking about in the future. So, with regard to prostate cancer, we know that it's one of the most common cancers in the United States. It's the second highest cause of cancer-related death among men in the U.S. You see the 248,530 cases and the new cases being diagnosed. You also see uh, that it's higher than all the other cancers listed there between lung and bronchus, colon and rectum, urinary bladder, and what this eventually means when you take it down at a population-based level is that prostate cancer is projected to account for up to one in four diagnoses in men in 2021 by itself. About one in eight men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer during their lifetime. And I already mentioned that it's the second highest cause of cancer-related death in the United States. So as you can tell, we're all gathered here for a very important reason to delay or eventually eliminate this entire process of mortality from prostate cancer via the various substages and intermediary points that exist between the physician, the physician and the patient. So getting to the simple description of the key terms. Now, if you're an organ confined patient or just getting PSA screened or talking about a biopsy, you might hear the prostate or prostatic word. Periprostatic is a very surgical term that people will talk about when describing areas around the prostate and the prostatic bed when describing radiation if the prostate's already been removed. So all of those things basically relate to the prostate gland itself. If you wanna touch your belt buckle right now, right below your umbilicus and go about one inch lower than that, you can feel the hard portion on top of your bladder that's protecting something, that's protecting your prostate. So now you even know where to find your prostate. So that's exactly where it sits. When you have the surgery, that's where people have to go to get it. And if you have the radiation, that's where the radiation beams end up going. So organ confined disease means that the, the disease is actually still within the prostate. It hasn't spread anywhere. It hasn't gone outside the prostate, it invaded the capsule, maybe in the seminal vesicles, nothing like that. It's just within the prostate itself and nowhere else. Biochemically recurrent disease or biochemical recurrence is a common term that people talk about a lot. It essentially means that the PSA or the prostate specific antigen test, the blood test that detects that protein, it's going up a little bit after the primary therapy. Now there are different scores and criteria to describe how much PSA going up is really concerning, as well as something called PSA kinetics, which refers to how fast they go up and maybe how fast the PSA doubles. PSA doubling time is also very important. But for the purpose of today's lecture, understanding biochemical recurrence as a rise in the PSA following primary treatment is reasonable. Now, the next set of terms come once the prostate cancer has become a little bit more advanced, maybe outside of the organ. And now we have to start talking about androgen deprivation therapy. ADT or androgen deprivation therapy is essentially the cornerstone of treating prostate cancer because of Huggins and Hodges in the early 1940s making discoveries that testosterone is essentially the fuel for prostate cancer. So if you want to stop the prostate cancer, you can remove the fuel being the testosterone. And that's what castration sensitive or hormone sensitive prostate cancer really means. It just means that if we lower the testosterone and give the androgen deprivation therapy, which comes in a number of different forms, then the prostate cancer will respond to that 
the PSA level should come down, the tumor should get a little bit better, maybe the symptoms will get better, and it is essentially a very reasonable way to treat the prostate cancer. The problem is that eventually the prostate cancer, the sneaky cancer, it's able to mutate, it's able to figure out a way to stop using the testosterone as the fuel or use very small amounts. Even that science is not completely understood right now, but eventually it turns into what's referred to as castration resistant disease, where even if you lower the testosterone to 50 nanograms or deciliter or 20, really low volumes, it still won't respond and it still continues to grow. The good news is that despite all of these substates and all of these different possibilities, there remain treatment options throughout. And that's why there's a lot of reason and cause to inspire hope that there is a, a number of treatment options despite going through the clinical cases of prostate cancer. So when we talk about non-metastatic and metastatic, this is one of the easiest questions to answer. Non-metastatic means you cannot see it on imaging, any kind of imaging, whether that's x-ray, bone scan, CAT scan, MRI, PSMA PET, whatever it's gonna be, you can't see it. Metastatic means you can see it. So in truth, just these two concepts between non-metastatic and hormone sensitive and metastatic and hormone refractory, these are the key terms that a lot of people get confused about and what urologists and medical oncologists and radiation oncologists and doctors are gonna do is combine these terms to kind of describe the prostate cancer bucket that you're going through right now. So because we're able to understand those key terms, now we can talk about how the actual paradigm falls into play. So we start with a patient around the time of diagnosis. Let's say they've been having PSA screenings, they are familiar with prostate cancer, they decided to go to their, their, their primary care physician or their internist, they got a PSA test, they eventually ended up with the urologist, they got a prostate biopsy and it turns out, okay, you have some cancer. It's gonna be organ confined disease for that specific patient, especially if their PSA is very low or not very low, but low. And you know they have a couple of cores and you get some imaging like a CAT scan and a bone scan and you know, it says that there's no evidence of metastasis. So those are the majority of patients in the United States, but these numbers, I have 75% saying local disease relapse. This is basically where we start on the prostate cancer continuum. I call this slide the high, low, high road and the low road. And it has absolutely nothing to do with ethics, morality, or any of that sort of uh, insinuation. It has everything to do with PSA screening. If you've had PSA screening and you're able to take this high road because you were aware of the cancer, it essentially causes us to break up the cancer into substages where while you're progressing through these substages, we're able to treat them. So an organ confined disease, you can offer radical prostatectomy, external beam radiation therapy, active surveillance. Uh, there are a lot of different treatment options for organ confined disease, but eventually the, the, you know, even when you remove the prostate, the cancer will figure out a way to come back, especially if it's a higher Gleason score or a tumor that's more aggressive. And that's where we talk about biochemically recurrent disease, which we already described as the PSA rising even after the prostate primarily has been treated by radiation or surgery. Then we talk about non-metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer in a similar way. Non-metastatic, you can't see it, hormone sensitive, ADT still works. So you can continue to give those ADT agents and lower the testosterone while it responds to that. But the problem is eventually it becomes non-metastatic, meaning you can't see it, but castrate resistant. That's when the cancer figures out how to stop using the testosterone, either through an androgen receptor amplification or some other uh, a resistance mechanism where those treatments no longer work. The good news is even in that stage, there are still treatment options available in MCRPC where you do have metastatic cancer all over. However, you can still respond to a lot of different treatments. Now, the reason why I call this the high load and the ro low road is because this is now the low road. Let's say you've never heard of PSA screening. You're not familiar with prostate cancer. It's unfortunately very common in society. Um, obviously, we're not in that group because we're at the Prostate Cancer Zero Summit. But a lot of people will not be familiar with any of these things. These people may lack PSA screening or lack the discussions with their physicians. And as a result, in, in young scenarios, uh, maybe 40 years old, 45, 50 year old males can present with what's referred to as metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer. So now since we're all experts on the terms, metastatic, you can see it on the imaging. You get a bone scan or a CAT scan and you see some tumors and it's hormone sensitive. So it will respond to lowering the testosterone. 
Now, these numbers, the 75% of local disease relapse and the 25% of newly diagnosed, those numbers are constantly changing in the United States because of the USPSTF recommendation screening guidelines that came out recently, and then the NCCN screening recommendation guidelines that also came out and have been, let's call it evolving over the course of time. So essentially what those screening guidelines indicate and what different guidelines indicate is that the ages of 40, 45, 50, and then some other ages like 50 and 70, 55 and 70 are absolutely critical times. And it's very important to discuss the value of PSA screening on a case by case basis with your physician based on the types of risk factors that you may harbor for prostate cancer. So what are those risk factors? They tend to be related to heredity, genetics, sometimes related to uh, chemical exposures, but there's not particularly hard information about that. There's conflicting data about certain causes of prostate cancer. Another thing that I should mention is that I have this little arrow here in the center of the screen because sometimes patients get treated from their organ confined disease and they do very well. They might get surgery, robotic prostatectomy, they might get external beam radiation therapy. And for five or six years, their PSA is so low that they almost forget that they had the prostate cancer. The problem with that is that if you forget and you stop again screening the PSA, what happens is that let's say they forget for three, four years, they'll come back with years, years later, they'll not have had treatment, but they'll have metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer too. And then you can again, continue to treat them it's just that the metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer may develop into metastatic prostate cancer within, it's written here 20 months on the slide, but you know, in that's, that's in that specific case study. It could take a lot longer and that thought process, you know, it's evolving. It doesn't necessarily need to take 20 months. That's just a reference. So now, since we went through the simple description of the key diagnostic terms, now we should go through the simple description of the key treatment terms, because this is where we start talking about the treatments. So neoadjuvant therapy, neo meaning new, adjuvant meaning accompanying, so new accompanying therapy with primary surgery or radiation. So that just means that it happened before the primary surgery or the radiation. Now, primary therapy, we talk about surgery or radiation in any form to treat organ confined disease within specific parameters. That includes a lot of stuff that we talked about, robotic, open laparoscopic surgery. That could also include external beam radiation, um, high intensity frequency ultrasound is now being tried. Also uh, conformal 3D beam radiation, brachytherapy. There's a lot of different options for organ confined prostate cancer. And then I just mentioned radical prostatectomy, which is the surgical removal of the prostate um, with the seminal vesicles and the vas deferens via open laparoscopic or robotic approaches. Then radiation therapy to or around the prostate, multiple modalities with that, a lot of different advances going on with radiation therapy in combination with uh, anti-hormonal or testosterone lowering agents that produce increased survival as well. Androgen deprivation therapy, we've discussed already as testosterone lowering therapy. And then since we had that key box of terms that we talked about non-metastatic and metastatic, now we have the treatments to match with those box of terms. So essentially, if you take the first slide and this slide and you try to remember them, you'll find that we try to match the treatments. And that's why the doctor is always asking questions. Now, we discuss the prostate cancer spectrum. And I like this slide because it essentially shows what happens between the relationship of the PSA, the physician, the discussion that's going to occur at that time, and what happens with patients who have more aggressive prostate cancer. When I was a clinician, I used to tell patients that there are two flavors or two varieties of prostate cancer. There's the pussycat variety, and then there's the tiger variety. The good news is that both of them are highly treatable, the problem is that sometimes the target variety, the tiger variety may become refractory to treatment and there are less options there. So when we start with the PSA level, first we, you know, we have that interaction before we said the urologist diagnosed the patient, they decided to have a treatment, they call it the treatment initiation and that's local disease. And at that time, they can have that surgery or radiation. Following that, you'll see a decline in the PSA. And then the PSA will eventually come back up if you have high grade disease or Gleason 9 or Gleason 10 or maybe a positive surgical margin. Eventually disease will come back by way of PSA recurrence. That's what they call the biochemical relapse. And then you can start either maybe some radiation depending on where it is or some androgen deprivation therapy which can come by gonadotropin hormone releasing antagonists or agonists. 
depending on what the patient preference preference is. And there are a number of different options between Luperlid, Triptorlin, um, Degarelex, Relegolix, uh, Histralin, Gocerolin, quite a few options there. The problem is eventually the ADT fails because the prostate cancer, you know, especially the aggressive tumors will figure out how to not use that. And, you know, you'll, you'll receive that benefit from the ADT. You'll get a PSA nadir, nadir meaning the lowest point of the PSA. And then the, again, the tumor will start to change its biology and learn how to survive without the um, testosterone. So that transformation is when it's becoming non-metastatic, means you still can't see it, but castration resistant meaning the testosterone lowering doesn't really work. And you know that because the PSA continues to rise. Now, another thing the doctor might test while you're on the ADT is your testosterone values to make sure they're very, very low. The goal of ADT is to make sure that your testosterone is low, androgen deprivation therapy to ensure testosterone stays very low. So, you know, again, these timelines I have in here, 40 months, 20 months, five months, don't take these as absolutes. In other words, these are observed in these studies. In reality, this whole timeline can take 30 years, especially in low-grade tumors. Just the biochemical relapse and the disease recurrence, we used to see octogenarians and nonagenarians with prostate cancer all the time, people who've been living for 20 years with prostate cancer. So just because prostate cancer progresses doesn't necessarily make it lethal. And the important thing to remember is that all of these these roller coaster slide that we refer to it as, they all have a multiple of different options, treatment options at that index point. If we are able to figure out that your PSA is progressing or the tumors are getting bigger or the patient is not doing well, then we can figure out where you land on this spectrum. If we're able to do that, we can appropriately decide which treatment is gonna give you the best shot at survival. So towards the end of the spectrum, we have metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. And now this is the one where it doesn't really respond to as many therapies, but there are still therapies that are used for that, like docetaxel and maybe pembrolizumab, bucaparib, olaparib, depending on your tumor mutation statuses. And at the bottom, I just put in a little, a little uh, symptomaticity grid that basically teaches you that you may not have symptoms of prostate cancer throughout this spectrum, or you might, which include blood in the urine or difficulty with urination, or maybe back pain if you have some metastatic disease or something like that. But the clinical presentation for prostate cancer is highly variable, meaning you, know, you never really know um, if you're gonna have symptoms or not. That's why PSA screening tends to be important and the discussion with your physician about the risk factors, as well as your heredity, as well as what you're expecting from your life expectancy and your comorbid diseases. These are all important discussions, no matter which age you're at, whether 40 or 70 at the end of that spectrum. Now, what are the potential treatment options following primary therapy and biochemical relapse? So we talked about surgery, what happens at the time of surgery, androgen deprivation therapy, we could talk about first-generation androgen receptor inhibitors, which include bicalutamide, nilutamide, flutamide, things that basically blocked the androgen receptor, the place where the testosterone binds. But now we have even more new therapies, newer therapies that have been undergoing a number of different studies and uh, changing the landscape in prostate cancer. We can start with abiraterone acetate, which is actually a CYP17 inhibitor indicated with, in combination with prednisone for treatments with metastatic, for patients with metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer, as well as metastatic high risk castration sensitive prostate cancer. Now we have three other androgen receptor inhibitors, which work a little bit differently than the CYP17 inhibitors, but they're all indicated for prostate cancer patients along the spectrum with enzalutamide and castration resistant prostate cancer and metastatic castration sensitive apalutamide and similar indications, uh, as well as uh, non-metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, and darolutamide, the androgen receptor inhibitor with uh, non-metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer current indication. It's also important to note that uh, the company's sponsors continue to produce very valuable data that is getting accepted at uh, top-tier conferences recently presented at ASCO-GU includes uh, follow-up analyses from Arches uh, for enzalutamide, as well as Aricens for darolutamide, which potentially suggests that there may be new treatment options coming for metastatic hormone-sensitive patients in the future, and maybe more treatment options for metastatic castration-resistant patients in the future as well. 
creating a good amount of excitement as well as a good amount of hope for the future in terms of having lots of uh, ability to treat different disease states irrespective of how the tumor continues to evolve and uh, not require testosterone and not require this and you know continue to try to outsmart it every step. So now speaking up and survivorship, this is where I believe that the advocacy organization as well as the patient have a really fundamentally critical role in developing how your prostate cancer treatment paradigm is going to go. Based on the fact that I gave you the open treat, the, the organ confined treatments and the first generation androgen receptor inhibitors and the androgen deprivation therapy, the second generation androgen receptor inhibitors, the novel anti-androgens, the uh, taxane based chemotherapies, then the uh, Radium-223, I didn't mention before, but radium-223 is definitely an uh, option in the metastatic castrate-resistant realm. My point is that there are roughly 20 to 25 therapies that can be used either independently or within combinations to ensure that we delay that slide, that roller coaster slide, to making it 30, 35 years, 40 years, or really no longer relevant because he died from something else. So that's the, generally the goal. So how are we going to figure that out? It's based on what the patient tells us during consult. So daily energy levels, these are things that you should be thinking about and you don't have to write it down, but everybody kind of knows, you know, if they feel good today, if they feel energetic today, if they feel tired today, exhausted, hungover, whatever the situation may be, the daily activity and exercise goals. Every day we have some level of activity that we do. We get up, we get dressed, we go to the market, we go to the gym, whatever it may be. What you want to do is have some understanding and appreciation for what that is on a month by month and maybe year by year basis to have a good understanding of, you know, these are what my habits are. Because if those habits start changing, especially if you have prostate cancer, those are all the things that you want to talk to your physician about so as to alert them to do the studies, the clinical evaluations, or the radiographic evaluations that are required to figure out where you are on that spectrum of disease, whether you're changing the box, are you going from metastatic hormone sensitive to non-metastatic castrate resistant, or you know what's, what's going on with you. So the sleep and dietary patterns help that too, because sleeping well at night, eating properly, eating a 2000 calorie diet and ensuring that there are lots of fruits and vegetables, very, very important across disease spectrums, not only for prostate cancer. Mood and behavioral patterns, as well as cognitive behavioral patterns are critical to note because we note that you know high levels of anxiety or a lot of depression associated with prostate cancer, thinking that, oh, you know, it's a terminal disease and I'm definitely gonna die from it. Those are all things that influence patients and there may be ways to improve your quality of life with cognitive behavioral therapy or a multifaceted shared care discipline approach. Uh, with uh, therapists, as well as nutritionists and other people. Urination and bowel habits, as well as sexual intimacy. Obviously, these are key considerations in prostate cancer, sexual intimacy being one of the dreaded complications of having surgery. However, modalities in surgery, as well as radiation, have been advancing over years. So now those complication rates do uh, tend to be lower than they were in the past. However, if you do experience a complication, then you know it may influence these types of things. Reasonable to talk to your doctor about them and have an open discussion about how that influences your life and how much of a value that is in your life. Because we've noticed that some patients don't have a very high priority over sexual intimacy as they get older versus others where it's a, it's a key cornerstone of their satisfaction and life happiness. The toxicity of treatments is actually critical if you're already on treatment for a prostate cancer one way or the other. Discussing how you feel and how it's made you change from before you took the treatment to now, those are critical things for the doctor to know to understand if you're getting entirely too fatigued, if you're not tolerating it, if you're constantly vomiting or having lots of diarrhea, something that is not going to be uh, beneficial for you, they can change the treatments. That's the key here, that they can have a, an open discussion about it, figure out exactly what's going on with you based on these symptoms, go back to that chart, kind of plot where you are and decide if something else is better for you. That's why I have understanding your personal trends as a concept at the bottom, because essentially that's what this is. This is understanding your personal trends over time with your energy levels, with your dietary levels, with your activity levels, with all of it. If you can understand that and then communicate it with the doctor quickly and succinctly and within a palatable digestible format, 
they're going to take that information and start using it to use those graphs and plots that I showed you before, try to figure out which box you're in, then which area you're on on the curve so that we can talk about the best treatment options for you today. So that was actually my last slide. And I really thank everybody for their attention. It gave me great, immense pleasure to give this talk. And I turn it over to the uh, organizers for their question and answer session. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. J. That was such a great overview. Um, and, and I have to say, on a personal note, I'm thrilled that you started with um, those definitions because I think it can feel so overwhelming. Um, but when you take a step back, just to see them all kind of laid out next to each other, uh, it can be extremely helpful. Um, but we do have a couple of questions that have come in. So just uh, as I'm going through these with Dr. J, um, be sure that you're putting any questions that you have in that chat and, and our team is grabbing them and, and sending them over to us. So a little sneak peek into the back end of, of what's happening here with us this morning. Um, but we do have a question kind of going back to the, um, the kind of glossary that you provided for us. Um, so this question came in uh, just a moment ago. Um, and, and this person said, uh, metastatic means visible outside the organ or bed of the prostate. Non-metastatic can be seen in the organ with scans, not just outside the prostate cancer. Is this correct? Yeah, so see, non-metastatic is a very like more confusing term now because the imaging modalities have been changing with time. Now we have this new imaging modality known as PSMA PET-CT, which is a little bit different. That one's coming into practice more commonly now. We're actually going to have a lot of great lecturers about that later on today to discuss the value of that new imaging. But non-metastatic traditionally, when you talk about CAT scan, bone scan, MRI, X-ray, all the modalities that I mentioned before, relates to that because they're saying that non-metastatic is non-metastatic related to those imaging. In other words, if you looked at the scans with me, which I used to do with my patients all the time, I'd say, take a look, see it for yourself. You can't really see a lesion there versus where you do have a lesion. It's fairly obvious. And then there's an intermediary zone where a radiologist is not 100% sure if it's a lesion, and then they'll say cannot rule out. But generally, non-metastatic means that it cannot be seen. Metastatic means that it can be seen. And biochemically recurrent is that kind of intermediary phase where we know the prostate cancer is probably coming back because the PSA value is very low, 0 0.5, 1, 1 1.5. But when we image, we still don't find anything. Kind of a mystery. Yeah, right. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I noticed you had uh, uh, some some additional um, definitions, and uh, we have a question that um, someone would like you to uh, provide an example, if you can, on neoadjuvant prostate cancer therapy. I think we, we've heard of neoadjuvant therapies and, and some other cancers that might be um, a little bit more commonly discussed than in prostate cancer, but could you uh, dig into that a little bit more for us? Sure. So it depends really highly on the type of tumor that you harbor and what kind of Gleason score you have, what kind of PSA you have, because if PSA is very high, the Gleason score is also very high. We call those tumors undifferentiated or poorly differentiated, which means that it doesn't really look like prostate. Well differentiated tumors with low Gleason scores and lower PSAs, Gleason score like three plus three equals six or four plus three equals seven. Well, that's more intermediate. But when you have a primary low score, that means the prostate cancer tissue actually looks like prostate. When you get these really high undifferentiated scores like Gleason 10 or small cell designation or undifferentiated or neuroendocrine variant, those patients really strongly need to consider neoadjuvant therapy because surgery by itself is probably not going to be enough. Even radiation by itself is probably not going to be enough because this is the, the real tiger tiger variety of prostate cancer. Right. We're talking about neoadjuvant, the, the vicious tiger, the saber tooth, I guess. Right. So in that scenario, you might start with docetaxel and radiation, then have surgery, or you might start with another type of therapy. Those, those therapies are really on a case-by-case -case basis, and it'll usually be discussed at an interdisciplinary tumor board if you're at a university. 
If you're at a large urology group practice, again, they'll have advanced prostate cancer specialists who will talk mm -hmm. about need for neoadjuvant. But yeah, in higher risk scenarios, it might be some shots of uh, hormone therapy prior to surgery. It might be a considerable amount of hormone therapy prior to radiation. But essentially, it'll be something where the pathology is you know, not favorable or not one of the pussycat variety prostate cancers where we know it's going to take 25, 30 years to die from this. But one of the more serious ones where even if we treat you as aggressively as possible, it still might advance in five to 10 years. So I might, uh, I hope that that helps. Yeah, very helpful. Thank you. Um, I have a question here from a, a listener. Um, is the lesion the same thing as a tumor? Yep. There are a lot of different uh, words. Uh, doctors love to make things, uh, let's call it uh, educationally comprehensive. So we have <laughs> seven or eight terms for the same thing. And that's what you guys are going to start figuring out as you get deeper and deeper into prostate cancer, hormone refractory, castration resistance, uh, hormone resistant. I mean, there's like so many ways to say that the testosterone doesn't work anymore. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a great uh, definition of the definitions. <laughs> I guess. Always like to keep it simple. Right. Yeah. Um, all right. We have another question, uh, Dr. J. Uh, I, I think um, this person is wondering about all of the levels that you uh, brought up on your chart. And where would um, the treatment of XDMD fall on that uh, level of your chart? Sure. So um, with regard to the second generation androgen receptor or the, the novel anti-androgen therapies, these are these treatments can fall a long way between the chart because it depends on their indications from the label. So I put up that slide of all those kind of more common drugs that are being used with their relative indications. But if you notice, those indication boxes are over a really wide spectrum. So drugs like abiraterone, acetate, uh, enzalutamide, uh, potentially darolutamide maybe in the future, and um, uh, enzalutamide, darolutamide, apalutamide, they can be considered throughout a, a pretty relevant time period during this uh, spectrum. So um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. It really depends on their indication and then the definition of terms that I gave you before, because if they're indicated, the doctor can talk about it. And we know that sometimes in practice and reality, the physicians may not necessarily follow the label exactly word for word. So that's why the physician discussion is important and everything is decided on a case by case basis. Great, thank you. I um, have another question, uh, really just about surgery in general. Um, why isn't it, uh, so easy that the tumor can just be removed in the prostate. Sure. So um, precision prostatectomy may be what this person is actually uh, advocating or considering or discussing. Uh, right now in surgical sciences, the really advanced surgical sciences and robotics, um, there are uh, some professors that are trying to remove only the tumor from the prostate. Now, this is really unverified. Uh, I don't think this is uh, well, well accepted yet. However, the pioneers in prostate cancer are trying to do this precision prostatectomy is what I've heard to it referred to it as, where you only remove the tumor from the prostate and you don't have to remove even the entire prostate. Again, that's not widely accepted. That's not currently done. That's not but the standard of therapy, the standard of therapy is to go ahead with the radical prostatectomy via open laparoscopic or robotic approaches and remove the whole gland. That's the standard of therapy right now. And that will, take the tumor with it. that will take the tumor with it. Right, yes, of course. Um, this person has a question. Uh, is there a reason why the PSA might go down significantly after a biopsy? Might go down significantly after a biopsy? Well, it could be because the biopsy was done as a result of some inflammation. Many times during the biopsy, we give antibiotics to ensure that you don't get an infection during the prostate biopsy. So if your PSA is coming down, there's no cancer, and your PSA was up after receiving antibiotics, you may have just had a urinary tract infection or a prostatitis, which responded to those antibiotics. Your PSA went away. You don't have any cancer. Sounds like a pretty good sale to me. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, this uh, patient has a question about, um, are there any ways that uh, one might be able to slow uh, disease that is metastatic? 
generally when the signs of metastatic disease are coming up, they're somewhat insidious. You know, it's very difficult to kind of figure that out for the patient as well as the physician. So there might be a lot of testing, but what we try to elicit during the clinical examination is the levels of fatigue, whether you have any new aches or pains, whether you have problems with the joints, whether you've been experiencing symptoms of inanition, which essentially means that over the course of time, say in the previous months, you were playing, eight, playing 18 holes of golf, but in the last two weeks, you could only get the front nine or the back nine, or in the last two months, you just noticed you're constantly wiped out. You may have some blood in the urine, some blood in the stool. There's a whole variety of symptoms it could be, but your general condition and the personal trend over time that I was talking about before is really important to document when you figure out that you might be developing metastatic disease because you're looking for your general constitutional symptoms as well as new aches and pains. I hope that kind of answers it. Yeah, yeah, very much. Thank you. And we do have time for a couple more questions, so I'll, I'll go through those until we uh, have to pass it to our next uh, presentation. But um, we have a question kind of uh, generally, I would say, around uh, radiation versus um, surgery. But um, what's, what's kind of the more conventional path right now? Ooh, so I know a tough one. <laughs> that's a, that's a very tough one because it really depends on who you speak to. If you speak to a urologic oncologist or a minimally invasive surgeon, I can almost promise you that they're going to recommend surgery, especially in high risk disease. However, after speaking with radiation oncologists for a long, long time now, I also know that they'll recommend radiation for high risk disease as well. The best thing I can tell each patient is to essentially discuss all of the treatment options as thoroughly as possible, including what the pathway would look like, and maybe even discuss with patients who've had that therapy before in an advocacy organization or something mm -hmm. like that to figure out what that pathway was really like, because it's such a variable thing by case by case. It's impossible for me to say that surgery is going to be better for this patient. Radiation is definitely going to be better for this patient. Very few people actually know that. So it really depends on what the treatment goals are, what the patient is looking to do, what their priorities are. And then you discuss it with your surgeon or your radiation oncologist. Uh, seeing both of them is a very reasonable thing to do to talk about what all my treatment options are when you've been recently diagnosed with organ confined disease. But giving you a catch all summary about that is really not possible. Of course, being that I did surgical training, I'm a big proponent of surgery, but I've seen the radiation data and that's pretty compelling too. So um, it's a case by case basis and everybody has to discuss what's best for them and their treatment priorities. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so would you say that it's a case by case basis uh, based on the diagnosis, but also a person's age, is that a factor as well? Something to consider? Absolutely, because it depends on what their what their key priorities are for after the treatment, because that might drive what treatment selection you prefer, depending on your, because remember, you have to take disease characteristics into consideration, long-term survival into consideration, what your current priorities are into consideration. If you have cardiovascular morbidity and mortality, there's so many things to talk about and discuss. And it's really about you knowing exactly what you want out of your life, or at least defining it as as you can so that your doctor has some clear vision of what this patient wants to be one and two years from now. So let me try to get them to their vision in the next couple of years. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, it looks like we have one more question if you're if you're up for it um, sure. before before we pass it on to the next presenters. Um, just a little bit uh, of a deep, deeper dive into side effects uh, from uh, ADT or hormone therapy. Um, so maybe if you could touch on a little bit of some of the more common side effects, but then also how often they tend to happen. And again, we know, sure. it's, we know it's all different. Um, you know, there's, it's difficult to predict sometimes, but um, if you could uh, share a little bit about that. No, that's, that's a very good question. And unfortunately, that's one of the problems. When you lower the testosterone, that actually influences a number of different organ systems, cardiovascular systems, your muscles, your bones. So androgen deprivation therapy and prednisone therapy, if you use abiraterone acetate, a lot of them are associated with long-term deleterious sequelae, including sarcopenia or loss of muscle conditioning, uh, central adiposity, developing central uh, excess abdominal fat, uh, as well as some cardiovascular manifestations, high blood pressure, 
and uh, um, breast tenderness as well as mammary gland tenderness. Sometimes that becomes a key consideration after starting androgen deprivation therapy. So a lot of those different types, as well as the fatigue and the lethargy, which is generally common. So I guess some of the major ones are the bone demineral de demineralization with a long time of androgen deprivation therapy, some of the cardiovascular effects and uh, some of the other effects that I mentioned. Wonderful. Well, Dr. J, thank you for uh, letting me call you Dr. J, first of all, and thanks for being here. Um, your presentation was amazing. Uh, I want to thank you. I want to thank Bear for, for uh, being our amazing sponsor of this session. Um, just a reminder, you can find more about Bear in our sponsors tab and read Dr. J's full bio um, in our speakers tab on the left-hand side of your screen. Just want to thank Zero, Shelby, and the rest of the organizers for a wonderful lecture. I'm so uh, terribly excited to be included with this stellar panel of presenters and look forward to the rest of the lectures today.